the um, it's a tall order to, to ask public financial management to be exciting. Um, however, I think that the fact that we've come together to be able to discuss it for five days is testament to not so much whether it's exciting or not, but rather how important it is. Um, and um, uh, from the bank perspective, um, it's it's so important um, that it's a lot of what our programming focuses on. Um, and the role that parliaments play and the role that SAIs play and the role that the um, uh, Ministry of Finance plays in these systems um, uh, is essential. It's not just about building capacity um, in one of the institutions, it's about how governance and PFM systems can work um, in a synchronized way. And I think um, Ricardo made mention to that in his presentation earlier today when looking at the, um, the systems-based graph that he had. Um, but today and for the next five days, we're going to be focusing in on certain components of those. In the session to, um, that we're in at the moment, we're going to drill down on the role of parliament in particular. Um, some of the sessions that we will be doing um, tomorrow in particular will start touching upon more specifically the role of the, um, the SAIs um, and also the Ministry of Finance. However, as we're going to see in this session, they're all intertwined. Um, so there's going to be some common themes running through each of these sessions. Um, but for the purposes of this session, we're going to start with looking at it from the lens of parliaments. Um, so let me first, um, oh, it's perfect, um, an outline of the presentation. Um, so the, uh, first off, what is parliament's role in the budget? Um, then we're going to look at parliamentary involvement ex ante, um, and then parliamentary involvement ex post. Um, and then um, just drawing upon what international good practice is. For the purposes of this presentation, what we've done um, is to draw upon um, the diagnostic um, uh, tools the bank has developed to be able to examine um, uh, how parliaments engage in um, PFM systems. We've also drawn upon um, good practice standards that have been developed by different organisations, um, an arrange, uh, array of different organisations, um, uh, from everything from the IMF and OECD, um, right through to um, independent global partnerships such as PIFA, um, some uh, NGO and CSO um, uh, uh, indicators and good practice standards such as um, GIFT and um, uh, the International Budget Project, um, and then also um, uh, parliamentary benchmarks and indicators, drawing upon what the, uh, where there is consensus around um, how, these, um, how Parliament should be operating as regards the budget. Mm -hmm. So let's jump in. The annual budget process. Um, the annual budget is the single most powerful development instrument available to a country. Um, and it is the, um, uh, and that's really one of the reasons why um, the development practitioners um, and um, the international organisations are so interested in the budget process because it's not just a piece of paper or a very large document in most cases. It's actually a mechanism through which you're able to um, uh, implement a strategy to be able to um, affect the lives of everyday citizens. Um, and thinking about it in terms of um, a tool for development, but also one in which you, it has multiple steps and it's an ongoing process, is critical to us being able to make sure that we, um, uh, that each of the PFM systems in your jurisdictions um, is as calibrated and working as efficiently and effectively as possible. Um, now the visibility of, of allocation implementation of public resources is fundamental to citizens' understanding of the government's plans for development. Um, so it's not just about um, good, well, good PFM or good financial management and budgeting processes. Um, it's not just about making sure that there is a, um, a balanced ledger. Um, it's also about how government and elected members of parliament and state institutions are able to engage with citizens. Um, you might have many policy documents, but policies are not able to be implemented without money. Um, you have to have resources attached to it to be able to implement. And um, often that communication can be lost. Um, the budget presents an opportunity for both government and also for parliaments to be able to communicate, liaise with, and receive feedback from citizens about um, priorities for um, the budgeting process, and then also be able to communicate to them um, some of the really hard decisions that you have to make on an annual basis as to where you put the money um, and how you prioritise the allocation of funds. Because there is no there's no budgeting system on the earth where there is um, uh, more money than what a country needs. There's always going to be more needs than there are 
resources. And so these decisions that have to be made in order to be able to identify the priorities where the money is going to be allocated and then making sure that if you've put your um, hard-earned money behind a particular initiative or policy proposal, that that money is used efficiently and effectively to achieve the objectives is where Parliament's come in. Um, why is it that we're so concerned with parliaments in that role? Um, there are a lot of CSO organisations and there is um, a lot of other demand side stakeholders who work on making sure that there is um, oversight and um, accountability around the budgeting process. Um, there are citizens' budgets, there is a whole heap of different initiatives. They all contribute to the broader dialogue, but ultimately there is only one constitutionally mandated institution um, that is authorised to be able to approve the budget um, and then oversee its implementation, and that is Parliament. Um, and so whether we like it or not, Parliament is a central player in public financial management, and more importantly, is one of the central um, uh, uh, um, institutions um, in the annual budgeting process. So we need to be able to understand how Parliament engages in this budget process um, on a year-on-year -year basis. <coughs> We work a lot with parliamentarians, um, and um, the way in which parliamentarians see the budget is through the parliamentary lens, um, and we'll go into that in, in just a moment. Um, some jurisdictions, there's a very close working relationship between the Ministry of Finance or Treasury or Department of Planning um, and the Parliament, and um, in some jurisdictions, there isn't. Sometimes there can be a bit of an antagonistic relationship. There's no evidence to say either way whether um, that relationship or that dynamic, whether it is on one end of the, um, the spectrum as compared to the other, is better than the other. Um, but one thing that is key um, to that relationship is um, a better understanding as to what goes on. Um, so when you speak with parliamentarians, and they're, very, um, they're quite cognizant of the role parliament plays in the budget process. Um, but um, sometimes they're not as aware of the um, parallel processes that are going on and that sometimes there is a misalignment between the processes around the budget that happen within the Ministry of Finance and the budgeting process that happens within Parliament. And often when there is that misalignment um, is when um, you don't have the most efficient system. So for instance, um, one of the, the um, uh, classic examples of um, or concerns raised by parliamentarians to the bank is that um, they would often not receive um, the budget documents um, with enough time to be able to consider them um, uh, in detail prior to voting whether or not the budget is passed or not. Um, and often that's because a lot of the preparatory work has been going, is going into those documents in the Ministry of Finance um, and it has taken longer or there has been a misalignment between the cycles so that Parliament doesn't have um, the, the two months that they should have in order to be able to fully consider the budget. Um, and it's really just an understanding as to how these cycles are meant to come together and be aligned um, uh, where a lot of these problems do occur. So in the diagram which is um, up on the screen um, is actually, we can't take credit for this one, it's actually the um, uh, Canadian Parliamentary Budget Office that put this together. And I think it's a, it's a wonderful diagram um, because what it does show is that the two arcs of the annual budgeting process um, and the steps or the areas where there's an interface with stakeholders. So you see on the top, that is the budgeting arc for Parliament. Um, and it, um, it's from ways and means through to the estimates. So ways and means looking at the allocations, the estimates looking at the actual, um, oh, sorry, ways and means looking at um, uh, the, everything from um, taxation to the economic forecast to um, the broader budget documents, um, through to um, the estimates process, which is ongoing. Usually you would have two to three of those a, a year. Um, and then finally, you're looking at the audits and the accounts. Um, the arrows between them are uh, an indication as to where um, the MOF's budget process and the Parliament's budget process would interface. And then you can see, and I'm sure our delegates from the Ministry of Finance in the room um, would see that the multiple different steps that need to be undertaken in the Ministry of Finance in order to be able to bring a budget to, to, to the Parliament. Um, and just sometimes it's a lack of information sharing um, where there can be some problems. So making sure that we try and align those arcs to the best of our ability is going to be key for um, ensuring um, improved performance. For the purpose of this session, though, we wanted to be able to drill down on that parliamentary arc. Um, so globally, irrespective of whether we're talking about um, 
the Lusophone tradition or the, uh, the Francophone tradition or the Anglophone tradition, um, there is a broad general framework for the way in which Parliament engages with the budget process. Um, and it's divided into two halves, ex ante and ex post. Ex ante looks at the budget formulation and the passage of the budget through Parliament. The moment the Parliament votes on the budget and the appropriations, you move to the ex post phase. The ex post phase has two subcomponents. The first is execution of the budget, and the second is um, uh, the um, oversight of budget implementation. So that's the external audit component. We're going to drill down on each of those in the presentation today, um, and very much looking forward to the um, presentations from each of the country delegates so that we can kind of understand the nuances between how um, the budget is addressed in um, each of the jurisdictions. I need to put a caveat on the presentation at this moment. Um, we do, and we collect a lot of data, and we do a lot of research on these issues, um, and there's one clear, one clear message that we have in all the research that we've done, is that there are no two parliaments that are the same. So we can seek to build these frameworks um, and develop um, aggregate understanding as to um, the budget processes um, within parliaments, but there are always nuances. Um, and um, so this is why venues such as this um, is so important because we get to better understand the practice in your parliament and we get to understand how you implement these broad frameworks and importantly um, how you've addressed some of the challenges that would come from just copy and pasting the way one parliament does it into your own parliament to make sure that you've got a, um, a, a good dynamic when it comes to dealing with budgeting issues within your jurisdiction. Okay, so the formulation of the budget. Um, so formulation and enactment of the first two phases, the ex ante phase. Um, the four phases of the budget from the Parliament's perspective, um, parliamentary engagement in each of those phases is different in this, um, to the extent that Parliament is involved. Generally, during the formulation stage, Parliament is not the primary actor. Um, it would be the Ministry of Finance. Um, but... Um, Parliament should have the opportunity to engage with the process in all, the, in all um, stages of the cycle. Um, there needs to be medium-term planning. There needs to be um, uh, budgeting envelopes that are attached to those medium-term um, goals. Um, and there also um, should be some involvement by the Parliament in helping to set the priorities for the budget. Um, this does not happen in all jurisdictions, but in some jurisdictions... Um, there would be um, uh, a document that outlines the budget priorities that would either be developed in consultation with the Parliament or sent to the Parliament for the Parliament to provide input into. Um, and then that would go into um, the process that happens within the Ministry of Finance to develop the budget framework um, and then be able to, to fully develop the budget and send it to um, Cabinet for approval. Um, ultimately, though... Um, the formulation stage um, vests with um, the Ministry of Finance. And governments should facilitate the engagement with parliaments and other stakeholders um, by making, um, uh, providing the information necessary to be able to um, uh, uh, ensure parliament can, can contribute in a substantive way. Um, and that's by um, ensuring that all expenditures... That's... That's why we need to make sure that all expenditures are accounted for um, and also looking at all revenues. And these are the sorts of um, uh, kind of um, figures that need to be supplied during the, um, the formulation stage. Um, now, how, does, how do parliaments engage with the formulation and enactment stage? Um, and it differs depending upon the jurisdiction you might be in. Um, generally, um, when you talk about um, the Francophone and Lusophone tradition, um, and also the, um, uh, the, the Latin tradition generally, it would be a um, consolidated system whereby you would have one primary committee that would be looking at both ex post and ex ante. Um, and um, so during the formulation stage, it would often be that committee that would look at the budget framework or the budget priorities and be able to give feedback on that. There'll be different procedures in place for consultations internally, um, or with um, uh, CSO organisations and community groups externally. Um, but ultimately, it usually is um, concentrated within that one committee. Um, the estimates process. Um, the, um, usually it would be done by um, the Finance Committee, 
um, often with the support of um, either a separate fiscal council, which is uh, more prevalent in um, uh, uh, traditions, uh, Lusophone and the um, uh, Francophone traditions, or in the Anglophone, what we're seeing is a very strong growth in what's called parliamentary budget offices, which is a specialised unit house within the parliament itself to be able to analyse the estimates, undertake um, um, medium-term forecasting, um, do tax and revenue um, assessments to be able to support the deliberations um, of the Finance Committee or the Budget Committee within the Parliament. Um, and um, ultimately, it's about accessing information. So at that stage, when these documents start to come to Parliament, it's important for Parliament to be able to not just see um, the priorities set by the government and also the um, suggested appropriations, but also um, understanding the data um, that it's based on. Um, because if you're able to verify the accuracy of the data and the analysis that forms the, the bedrock of the, um, the budget document, then you can focus your deliberations more so on um, uh, whether or not the budget allocations will achieve the development objectives um, as set out, as compared to whether or not the, um, the, the data that has gone into its formulation is important. Um, I think a very good example here would be in situations where you look at extractive revenues coming onto the budget documents. Um, in those instances, often um, forecasting revenue is very difficult, um, and it is often based on um, a, a forecast price, say, of um, uh, crude oil per barrel. Um, if the parliament doesn't understand how that pricing has been um, undertaken by the ministry, um, then it will not have confidence in, whether, uh, in the, um, the kind of the full bundle of resources the budget seeks to allocate and disperse to um, implementing agencies. Drafting the budget. So once the um, budget is drafted by the Ministry of Finance, transferred to Parliament, um, there is um, uh, um, different processes in place to be able to consider that. And you can think about this as a matrix. Um, or a sliding scale. Um, and it moves from a, having a central committee that looks at it, um, and it can be a consolidated committee that would also be looking at the ex post phase, right through to um, a committee of the whole. So in between, you would have consolidated committee that deals with the entire budgeting process, which is um, uh, the prevailing practice in um, uh, lucifer jurisdictions. You would have um, a model where there would be one committee that would receive the budget documents and then would um, uh, uh, transfer different components to the um, sector um, committees to be able to review. Um, you would have um, ad hoc arrangements sometimes. Some parliaments would create an ad hoc committee on an annual basis to consider the budget. Um, and then in other instances, the parliament would think that um, the, um, it's of such interest to all parliamentarians they would create what's called a committee of the whole which is pretty much plenary, except you apply committee rules to the plenary. And so it's, it becomes a very large committee. Um, the, these are the different mechanisms. Um, each, for each, there is pros and cons. Um, but it's understanding how your committees deal with this will be important because it um, reflects upon how, um, what stage of the budget process you have pro traditionally prioritized and also where you've developed historically your um, expertise within the committee. Um, and it is a, um, a good um, bellwether for understanding entry points to be able to enhance capacity or enhance performance over the medium term because you can focus on those areas of the budget that your committee might not have been spending as much time previously. Um, there's a number of different, and we can, I think, uh, copies will be made, made available. Um, but there are a number of different um, principles that should be adhered to um, that are commonly recognised. Um, and there's a couple there. I'm, I don't think we need to go into these at this stage, um, but we're going to have an opportunity over the next five days to be able to really kind of drill down on some of these um, core principles. Um, I did want to note, though, um, and this is... Um, uh, there is a debate um, similar to... And I'm, we'll have this debate later in the week. Um, with the auditing, the Supreme Audit um, Institutions, there has been a debate over the years as to whether or not there should be just financial audit, compliance audit, or performance audit. Um, and there's been a, a move over the years to be able to, for the SAIs to start using performance audit. Well, similarly on the, um, the budgeting side, um, there's been a move um, from output-based budgeting to um, performance budgeting. 
um, output was very much kind of just line item allocations, whereas um, performance-based budgeting um, seeks to use the budget document to be able to um, achieve objectives. So it's all about mobilising the funds and getting them to the agencies that can work on the initiatives that will achieve your um, uh, development objectives um, stated not just in the budget but also in your um, uh, uh, national development plan. In order to be able to do that effectively, um, you need to have the performance in information. So um, it's not just saying this agency should get this amount of money. Um, it should be saying, right, they need to be able to they get this, uh, this uh, kind of um, uh, resources, but they're going to do this, this, and this with it. Well, actually, it doesn't even need to be all that prescriptive as to what they're going to do with it. It needs to be prescriptive in the sense of um, the benchmarks to which they will be assessed. So for instance, um, if one of your objectives is to be able to increase um, uh, child literacy, um, then and you find that in one of your provinces um, there is particularly low child literacy, then um, performance information um, or performance-based budgeting um, would seek to allocate additional resources to that province for that purpose. Um, and it wouldn't be just a matter of saying, right, well, you get X amount of extra dollars to be able to do this. It would be saying, you get this money, but you need to use this in order to achieve these benchmarks. And that might be bringing up child literacy rates to the same level as the other provinces within your country. Um, it also helps your committees, because when it comes time to looking at whether or not the government has been effective in implementing its budget, um, the standard by which they should be assessed has already been set out. So there's no confusion at all. It's um, you're really able to hold them to account. Um, the, um, I was talking before about the different types of committee structures um, and um, the way that each parliament does it a little differently. The big debate often is whether or not you um, house it all in the one committee or whether or not you, you um, engage and empower the entire parliament to consider the budget documents when they hit parliament. Um, there are pros and cons to it. Um, if in your system Parliament isn't given enough time to consider the budget, um, then having it centralised in one committee makes it a more time efficient. Um, so, and it also means if you've got a functional committee doing it, you have a better opportunity to build, build technical capacity within that committee to deal with what is ultimately a really quite a complex process. Um, on the other hand, if you um, refer certain components of the um, estimates the appropriations whether, um, um, to sector committees, then there is an opportunity for them to deploy sector committee expertise to analysing the budget. It also means that you can um, mobilise the entire parliament um, to be able to consult with the community and come back with any kinds of amendments, reviews um, or comments that need to be provided on the budget document before it goes to plenary for approval. Um, so pros and cons both ways. Don't need to go with that moment. Um, the, um, I wanted to move to the um, ex ante stage. Um, before we do, um, and we will go into this, I forget, is it tomorrow? Um, uh, PIFA, I think it's yeah. tomorrow or Wednesday, uh, tomorrow afternoon actually. Um, we're going to be looking at um, the PIFA indicators in greater depth. Um, and um, the new PIFA framework, um, draft framework, has been released. Um, and um, I have to say I'm, I'm a bigger, much bigger fan of this new framework than I was of the last framework. Um, I think it has sought to um, and adequately resolves some of the um, uh, main deficiencies in the global dialogue we've been having around um, parliaments and budgeting processes and that it has come from a very Anglo perspective. Um, and um, the reality is the way in which parliaments mobilise to deal with um, budgeting issues is very different when you look at, um, uh, say, the Francophone or Latin traditions. Um, and um, we're learning more and more about the Lusophone, but I think that I'm going to learn a lot this week. Um, but the new framework, which we're going to go and uh, Marion will um, be presenting on tomorrow afternoon, um, seeks to adjust um, the framework and um, respond better to the, um, the differences in, in the, um, uh, the structural um, engagement between parliaments and the budget process in different jurisdictions. Um, so let's turn to ex post. Um, ex post is one of the areas where there is the greatest difference. So there's a bit more of a convergence in the ex ante phase um, across different jurisdictions globally. Um, it's in the ex post phase that things start to get a little bit different. 
So the classic example or the um, uh, distinction is between consolidated systems and bifurcated systems. A consolidated system is something that you have um, within um, the Portuguese-speaking um, parliamentary community, you have within the Francophone community, and to some extent you've got within um, uh, the, the Latin community as well. Um, and this is um, contrast to the bifurcated systems you find in the Westminster Anglophone systems. Um, so the, ultimately there is the two stages within the ex post phase. You've got the execution and then you've got the external audit. So in um, different systems, you're going to have different committees looking at different issues. For the execution, usually it would be the sector committee that oversees a government department would be looking at um, uh, ongoing performance and whether or not that committee, uh, whether, whether or not that ministry is implementing the budget as scheduled. Um, in order for your sector committees to be able to do that effectively, um, they would need to get updated information um, and periodic reporting from those line ministries. Um, it's considered that every three months an update would be um, reasonable um, and um, if there is updated um, uh, financial management information then that shouldn't be a problem. And I, I understand that we're going to have a presentation on um, IFMIS systems later in the week. Um, the, um, uh, so we can go into uh, greater depth there. In some systems um, the, um, the budget and finance committee would also be looking at execution of the budget as well. Um, but in Westminster or bifurcated systems um, the ex post committees, um, in particular the audit committee, does not look at execution. Um, so um, when you're looking at implementation of the budget, um, there often are, and this is one of the areas where we find the greatest discrepancy as well, is the jurisdiction of the particular committees or even the parliament as a whole to be able to look at where that money is being transferred to and how it's being used. Um, so we've got a list up here which just looks at, ask a couple of questions about um, the extent to which um, you're able to oversee different aspects of budget implementation. Um, and we don't need to answer these or go into these now, um, but I just thought I'd put that up there for a, a bit of food for thought. Um, was often there is, there is quite a difference depending upon the, um, the committee or the parliament that you come from. Um, so let's delve down into the audit stage. The audit stage, Similar to many other stages, um, there's a, um, a sliding scale of the way in which parliaments um, arrange themselves in order to be able to handle the, um, uh, the fourth stage of the budget process. And it, it starts on one end with a consolidated system, similar to what um, we have in many Portuguese-speaking countries. Um, so that's one committee that focuses on both budget formulation um, and uh, enactment, and then also examination of the audit reports that are received from um, the Supreme Audit Institution and oversight of implementation of the budget. Um, then there is the, um, uh, the middle midpoint where you would have still a consolidated system, um, but you would have um, separate subcommittees that are authorised to examine specifically audit related issues. Um, and I think the prime example there would be um, uh, the German system. Um, and at the far end, you would have a completely bifurcated system where you would have an ex ante committee such as the finance committee or the budget committee and then you would have um, an audit committee such as the public accounts committee. Um, there are two variables there that, have, um, that define that relationship. Um, we find that there is a correlation between um, the type of parliamentary system you have um, and then the committee structure. So for instance, um, in presidential systems and hybrid systems, which are most common, say in um, lusophone or francophone systems, you'd usually have a, um, a consolidated system. Um, and um, uh, whereas if you look at the um, parliamentary systems, more often than not, they would be um, bifurcated. Um, the political reality is, is that um, the Westminster systems, they don't have much of a say in the budget process. Um, ex ante, they're very weak. Um, they, they often don't like to say it, but you know, they, it's not very often you'll see a parliament that's going to um, make any amendments to the budget or, or give it much consideration. It's usually quite a quick process. And that's ultimately because in a parliamentary system, um, if you can't get your budget through, then it constitutes a vote of no confidence in, in the um, plenary um, and your government will fall. Um, so just a political reality is that they have a greater emphasis on the ex post. Um, whereas if a budget is delayed or doesn't necessarily get through in a hybrid or a presidential system, then the executive doesn't fall. Things become a stalemate, but, thing, um, but um, uh, the post won't um, dissolve. 
Um, the other variable which has a, had a huge impact on the way in which parliaments have um, arranged themselves um, is the relationship with the SAI. Traditionally, um, in um, uh, the Napoleonic model, um, you would have the uh, Court of Com, uh, which would sit within the judicial jurisdiction of um, a governance system, um, and it would be tasked with um, performing the two primary audit types, financial and compliance. Um, ultimately, the um, uh, reports that are produced by the Court of Goms would have to go to Parliament for Parliament to um, uh, verify and then vote on approval of the accounts. Um, but there has not been traditionally that same direct sort of relationship. Whereas in the, um, uh, uh, the Westminster system, um, where you would have the Auditor General model, there is that direct relationship, and often the Auditor General, although not exclusively, would be a, a parliamentary officer, um, which means that the um, spe uh, specialised committee would have more of a say in the, um, the auditing um, mandate and responsibilities of the SAI, but also um, those reports would be directly tabled in Parliament. Um, and traditionally, there had been a, a faster uptake of performance audit by the Auditor General models than there were from the quarter comps model. I think that globally we're seeing the quarter comps model really catch up on, um, when it comes to performance auditing. Um, and so I think that that has a huge potential to not only um, uh, um, enhance the capacity um, for um, uh, non-Westminster parliaments to be able to engage more strongly in the external audit phase of the, the budget, um, but it also has the potential to really redefine the relationship between the audit office um, and the parliament. So it's, it's quite an exciting stage in, in that evolution there. Um, some key principles that um, we like to see when it comes to the um, external audit. Firstly, um, size. Um, the research we do suggests that the, um, the most efficient um, uh, membership would be somewhere between five to 11 members. Now, we see configurations vary from three members right through to, I, I've seen some committees with 60 to 70 members. So there's a huge variance there. Um, but it really, when it, if you want a kind of a, a working committee, um, even at its heart, you're gonna find um, five to 11 members. Um, and, and they're more so the working members. So if you've got a really large committee, just making sure that your, your quorum to meet is low enough that you can get those key five to 11 members together to be able to do collaborative work for the committee to keep on going. Um, and then political representation, um, that when it comes to um, oversight, particularly when it's external audit, ensuring that um, an opposition voice is um, uh, included within the debate, because that's the whole system, is the counterbalance between supply and demand. Um, and there's different tools, different ways you can do that. Um, and um, in the um, Westminster system, that often mean the opposition would chair um, uh, the um, Public Accounts Committee, um, but that's never a guarantee that um, um, there is a, a balanced committee. It's just one of the tools that can be used.